Okay, let's go ahead and uh, dive in. This is Dan Kahn from CNCF. Um, I see we have 15 folks on the call right now, uh, which I think counts as quorum. Uh, insanely, there's like um, 250 people on this uh, uh, mailing list. No, 117 people on the mailing list, which uh, just says there's a lot of people who care about software conformance. So uh, we, we haven't had scheduled meetings and um, we had some requests to set this one up. Um, we're uh, set for the second and fourth Friday, uh, excuse me, Thursday of every month. Let's give this a try for a month or so and then decide if maybe just once a month or something uh, might make sense uh, based on how much agenda we have and, uh, and material to go through. But uh, based on this agenda, which I appreciate uh, William putting together, I was just going to give a, um, a two-minute update, which I think is mainly the same thing that I said in, um, in Austin in our in-person meeting. And then we can go through a few other areas. And then I do want to circle back at the end to this uh, contract development of conformance test that I've mentioned before. And um, so without um, coming off as complacent, I, I really do want to take a moment and just point out uh, how extraordinarily successful our uh, conformance program has been to date. And um, again, not to uh, go too far on it, but I, I would really compare it to almost any other conformance program in the history of, of uh, software or open source software or something like that, where um, it's almost unprecedented to have gotten, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, I think it was 38 uh, companies out of the gate and we're currently up to 49. And I'll just paste that spreadsheet in. And so uh, obviously that success is, is really due to all of you and, and particularly the, the Kubernetes community and SIG testing and SIG architecture and the steering committee and, and everyone else. But um, I, again, I, I see it as basically unprecedented to get everyone in the industry to sign up. And I think we have, um, it's literally nine stragglers at this point. And several of them just like tried to certify the wrong version or are not sure they're going to continue with that product line or other, you know, things come up. Um, but the, the, obviously the, the big exception to that is Amazon where uh, they're not certified yet, but they have announced that they will be certified when their product reaches uh, GA, which should be in just the next couple of months. So assuming things keep going forward with that, um, this is really something we, we can all be proud of. And so now the question is just how to make the program better. And so I think we're, we're all aware of the fact that there's some limitations, particularly in the quality and breadth of the conformance suite. And so um, for CNCF and, and me personally, it's a big priority to invest in that over uh, 2018 and try and end the year with um, that certification meaning much more than it does uh, today. Um, Diane, to get access, I'm oh, sorry, uh, some people are having trouble accessing this document, and um, you just need to be part of Kubernetes Dev, I believe. I'll, uh, I'll put the link in the in the chat. Uh, but yes, yeah, so you just have to join that mailing list. You don't have to actually get the, the mail, uh, but you just have to be a member. Uh, but I, I'll go ahead and give you uh, access to answer. So there you go. Um, okay. Well, let me stop there. Uh, any other intro comments or questions about where things stand? I mean, I, I kind of presume that most of you are watching the GitHub um, repo. And so you're seeing between that and the email list, essentially all the interactions that we're having with folks. And we continue to have people you know, make little errors or, or need help with things or, or other stuff. But I, I feel like uh, we've able to, been able to be um, pretty responsive I do want to give a shout out to Caitlin Bernard, who was the launch person on this and our marketing team um, and, and really did a fantastic job on, on when things were a lot vaguer of, of working through all that. But uh, I'm pleased to say that she's actually been able to train our project manager, Taylor Wagoner, and Taylor, Taylor has now uh, taken over all these functions. And so, you know, she still escalates to me or Caitlin 
any questions or, or vagaries she has, but then we, we generally go back and the directions. So um, the process could be as, as well documented and transparent as possible. Um, um, and I'll stop there. There was right. one ge general PSA I wanted to mention. Uh, in preparation for our, what Ken had uncovered in our conversations during the uh, at KubeCon, um, we have set up a separate subproject uh, called Testing Commons to be as the, the clearinghouse location for folks if they want to get their PRs reviewed in a timely fashion or if they want to converse with other folks on the topic of conformance tests as well as other testing common area, uh, that that's probably the most uh, beneficial subproject to uh, be the clearinghouse for this stuff. Um, there is information in the community site, and I can also post it inside of this uh, uh, these notes here for other folks to take a look at. But that's that's the venue for upstream now. Uh, besides SIG testing, SIG testing has the main meeting, and then there's a subproject meeting now specifically devoted towards this type of this focus. Cool, thank you. All right, um, great, thanks, thanks for that intro, Dan. I think that sets the scene perfectly for what uh, Jago was about to talk about. Um, and the, the link is, I'll just paste the link in the chat for anyone else to, to see the doc. Uh, thanks, and congratulations to everyone. Great, very well run uh, on your behalf for sure. Dan, thank you for all your work making this launch uh, as successful as it was. Uh, at the, the top of the doc, I kind of put some background uh, just for future civilizations uh, or our future selves looking back at this time in the conformance program. Uh, and just wanted to give the context that we intentionally focus on the process of evolving the conformance program uh, ahead of building out the surface area coverage of the conformance program. Uh, that was both to ensure the widest participation uh, and also because we didn't want a flurry of activity in what was considered conformance leading up to the launch of that program. Uh, so that was very intentional. Uh, it was a recognized gap even in the very earliest conversations. Uh, and just as a reminder, uh, conformance label was essentially that, is a text string that anyone could add to any test uh, and call that part of conformance. Uh, and so there is a disproportionately high number of conformance tests in some areas where some engineers just happen to think that was useful, uh, but really no rigor around what ought to be part of a conformance test suite. Uh, so thanks uh, to a lot of work by uh, Tim St. Clair and Matt Liggett, uh, we have both a repeatable way to run tests uh, and ways that are clear for adding new conformance tests. Uh, and this document goes through a few areas uh, that I think are the result of just thinking through this and previous conversations with this group. Uh, and I think there are a couple parts that do uh, that will likely need some conversation uh, when and how uh, conformance tests ought to be added and what the, the priority for those tests ought to be. Uh, I think the part one, the long-term sustainability, uh, part of this came out of conversations uh, through the governing board about uh, how to close the gap in conformance tests. Uh, I have opined before and still believe that there are a, uh, a large number of assets we have lying around, end-to-end uh, -end tests, which are perfectly appropriate to be part of the conformance test suite, uh, and simply need to go through the process of adding that. Uh, I think we will exercise the process of getting SIG architecture to agree that that is the appropriate test to add, uh, and the mechanics of adding that to the, uh, the canonical list of what are conformance tests. Uh, so, specifically, I think the, the highest priority areas to add are for the workloads API. Uh, the, the real value of this program to end users is that they will know that their own workloads will run on conformance Kubernetes clusters. Uh, 
Uh, so by workloads and API, we're talking about deployments and daemon sets and stateful sets, for example. Uh, and it's critical that conformant Kubernetes clusters expose those APIs for users to be able to depend on them. Uh, I also suggested a couple of toes in the water in API machinery. Uh, garbage collection and watch are important for uh, many of the use cases that users writing uh, custom controllers, for example, need to be able to depend on the watch API. Uh, and so the, the two I suggested for uh, API machinery were the garbage collection and watch. Uh, and so there are some folks uh, looking to add those EDE tests to uh, the conformance program as well. Uh, I think no, SIG node uh, ought to propose some tests. I haven't even taken a swing at what those ought to be, uh, but I think that that's an important area as well, uh, and one that will likely drive some interesting conversations about what does conformance mean uh, as it applies to the Kubelet. Uh, and then towards the bottom of the doc, uh, I mentioned briefly the new test development. I, expect we will find areas that either don't have EDE tests that uh, the related SIGs wish had existed at some point, uh, or that it, through this process we discover ought to exist. Uh, and I think there, there may be two ways to uh, approach this. One is through a uh, data-driven test suite uh, that's based on earlier work that Eric Toon did for auth. Uh, and seem to be an effective way to create non-flaky tests uh, that don't necessarily focus on the behavior, but focus on the API surface area and that it exists. Uh, and so I dropped a link in, in the effort underway uh, for one of the, uh, for a data-driven test that exercises, I think at this point, only namespace resources. Uh, there's a possible follow-up PR to that or non maintenance based resources, uh, but that is out in the future. Uh, and then we've also discussed uh, through with uh, CNCF contracting with uh, external vendors to potentially have a sort of one-time uh, amnesty program for SIGs. Oh, I, I wish this test that always existed, I've never gotten around to writing it. Uh, and I expect there will be a small uh, final percentage, the final 10 or 20 percent, uh, that will likely require some uh, effort to write those tests, and uh, and they will be approved, of course, by the community. But uh, that is touching on the discussion about getting some some funding from the CNCF to uh, outsource some of that. Uh, so I'll stop there. I think that's a, a, a fairly good starting point. Uh, and uh, again, this is a, a brainstorm phase. Uh, once you get through the initial, generally directionally right, uh, I do expect to turn this into a cap and go through that process uh, just to make sure there's full visibility. But it's been useful to have initial feedback from this group uh, before it even gets there. Uh, and I, I think that pattern is one we've agreed uh, is useful to continue. So I've got two questions. Uh, one is, how are you measuring coverage? Uh, I don't think it's code cov. It's, uh, it's based on the, the APIs, right? It's um, API surface coverage, right. uh, and that is an important <clears throat> distinction. I think it is the, uh, the implementation is to be API conformant, right. uh, and <clears throat> there are many ways that users can swap out different components, uh, and I think we're not going into that level of detail. So it's basically just looking at like which APIs are actually called during the EDBs. Yeah, and I, I think by definition, the EDEs are sort of external hitting APIs, not uh, internal. In right. Uh, however, I expect there are some, there is some breaking of rules. So yeah, so there's no, there's no guarantee that, like, we're only looking at which APIs are hit, not necessarily that they that they test completely as well. I guess that's, that's another topic in the future. Yeah, that's actually something I was going to ask about because API coverage from just saying you hit the API may not be sufficient. I think 
at some point it'd be really nice if we could get some kind of uh, brainstorming th or thoughts around possible ways to test the different variants in which the APIs can be called, right? Because it's, you know, that, what are the parameters? What are the different values for the parameters? And then different scenarios in which they can be invoked. I know that's, that's non-trivial and not necessarily something that's machine generatable. Um, but I'd like to at some point see if we can think about ideas to maybe increase our coverage or our, our measuring of our coverage based upon the actual semantics of what we expect to have happen and instead of just did you hit this API because they just hand the API alone isn't yeah. Yeah. a lot of a lot of the tests that exist today are behavioral driven ones I mean they're it's not complete by any far stretch of the imagination but most of them are exercising that yes you hit the API but you also exhibited uh, response and behavior that you expected from hitting that API before you completed it. So all of the E2Es that exist today are, are built in that, that vein. So they're not just pure coverage, they're, they're behavioral driven tests. No, uh, no, I understand that. I, I agree that, that the tests themselves test behavior. I'm not questioning that. What I'm questioning is the, our code coverage statement, right? Because let's say our entire API set consisted of a single API but there are 255 different ways in which you could invoke that with different parameters and stuff, right? Our, our coverage tool right now will say, hey, we have 100% coverage, even though we may only test three variants. That's, that's my concern. Yeah. Uh, I, I think uh, Tim's point is, a, is an important one though. Uh, the data-driven test, for example, is not testing behavior. It is explicitly not testing behavior. It is only creating a resource of a given name, updating that resource and deleting it, for example. Uh, so that may be necessary to demonstrate that the API is exposed to end users, uh, but it's not sufficient to demonstrate that the user gets the behavior they are looking for. Uh, and so those are different layers. And I think, uh, Doug, what you're calling out is yet another deeper layer. Uh, and I think through this process, it's important to go through and prioritize uh, how, what the goals are, and I think that the primary goal ought to be to demonstrate that the API is exposed uh, and then get into uh, behavior, uh, most common use cases first, uh, and then I think we will likely see some debate as we get into more nuanced uh, differences between environments. Yeah, I definitely am in favor of a, of a layered approach, um, so I definitely agree with that or a stepwise approach, I should say. And so one of the, one of the important elements of this doc is, is uh, looking at new features too. So we have the, the bug amnesty, the test coverage amnesty program. Um, but I think from what I heard from Dan, um, what you passed on from, from the board meeting uh, regarding this amnesty is that it's not gonna be open-ended, that we need to make sure that, that at least going forward all new features have uh, conformance coverage. So, one thing we're hoping to get the community to adopt is a policy that uh, features going to GA have uh, associated conformance tests. Now to achieve that, we probably need to actually be getting those test developed uh, a lot earlier than that. Um, so Jago and I are kicking around a couple ideas like, do we need to have like a beta conformance tag um, that basically indicates this is a conformance test for a beta feature. It's not technically part of the program yet because the feature is not yet GA, but it's something that potentially we can package up in like a son of boy run that people can be kind of analyzing ahead of time, seeing if they have any problems, seeing if they're, if they're conformant to it, uh, so that when the feature itself graduates to, to GA, we can graduate the test at exactly the same time, knowing what impact that would, would have uh, on various people's uh, levels of conformance. Um, is there any feedback on that? It depends upon the API group, really. Um, some API groups, uh, have a track record of growing into GA things, but sometimes there's a shuffling that occurs across API groups, and that is actually very painful. So if you were to do an API-driven test and you switched groups, like even in Sonoboy, we have a lot of glue logic right now that exists that detects and checks for this shuffling of API groups. And the, the earlier reference of apps and daemon sets that was an example of something that was originally in extensions and now is in apps and now is going to GA. So mm -hmm. like, I think being careful about when we tag it as beta conformance and making sure it's got a track to success is, 
it, it's going to be a little bit of tap dancing because the ability to for us to be able to test that and give accurate signal it is going to be rough across versions if they start doing this API group switching. Right. I think you might want to call it a conformance candidate as opposed to a beta, right? Because it's a candidate for conformance, um, you know, just, just to make it clear. It may never make it all the way from candidate to real conformance, well, but no. I guess, but I would, I would expect that every feature of Kubernetes should have a conformance implication. So uh, a couple thoughts on this. One is if the if the tests are uh, checked into the Kubernetes repository and are versioned along with the Kubernetes version, uh, then there ought not within that version to be a mismatch in API group. I do see that some of the upgrade rollback functionality might get horrendously complicated. So I I think that deserves some more thought. Uh, I can see that. Uh, and uh, just one, one outcome of this, I hope, is that this group, who are also involved in other uh, working groups and SIG, will start the conversation about what are the conformance implications of this feature far earlier in the process. Uh, so that I, I hope that we start to build that into the CAP process and re just requests on pull requests and have you considered the test for this and which part of this is required or intended I, I to be for Kubernetes. I think that should probably be put onto SIG architecture to basically add maybe something to the template of the cap that outlines it's there is something that outlines the path of its life cycle to GA, but maybe we mm -hmm. could explicitly say like the path of the test to, to GA and make sure that there is coverage. Um, I, I'm I'm totally in favor of that and I think that's a great idea. Awesome. Uh, the other thing I wanted to follow on what William was talking about, making sure there's visibility on the way through the life cycle, uh, is that I'm also involved in the uh, effort to extract the cloud provider code outside of core. Uh, and I think there are important implications here as well. Uh, and one of the things that we've been working on there uh, to get ahead of the madness uh, is to have other uh, have all cloud providers running uh, CI uh, tooling in their own environments and then posting their test results back to uh, test grid. Uh, we have a wonky idea to actually make test grid a multi cloud uh, application as well. So if you're interested in that, let me know. Uh, but uh, hoping to visualize a dashboard with the uh, cloud providers that are participating there. Uh, in a single dashboard, so if someone working on one cloud, cloud provider inadvertently breaks another one, we surface it really early. Uh, and I think that fits in really nicely here as well. I would uh, expect that would be a useful signal for folks participating in the conformance program. It's, uh, as, this is really thorny in the fact that history has taught us people don't look at test grid unless it's a blocking test. Right? And this has been ongoing for a long time. and I see Justin is up there and we get coverage immediately when cops break something. So we know <laughs> intimately well when something is breaking for cops, right? And without having that blocking level signal, uh, it becomes kind of blind to a lot of people because there's so much noise, right? Uh, in the system right now, uh, that is, it is, unless you are the provider and you are looking at it yourself and you're, you are keeping a watchful eye on it, everyone else will kind of turn down that noise and have no idea what's going on. Yeah, I, I agree the signal to noise ratio is uh, unsustainable. <laughs> I, I do see that. Uh, I can think of some ways and some groups that may be able, uh, that we might inspire to keep an eye on it at least around release time. Uh, and if we do have this concept of a conformance beta or, or candidate, uh, just be getting on top of it earlier can avoid some really uncomfortable and difficult conversations towards the end. Who, who's, this, who's this talking? Um, sorry, I can't see. Hey, the, sorry, this is Jago McLeod. Hi. Hi there. Um, uh, this is Bob Wise. I'm, uh, I'm the GM for EKS. Um, uh, this is an area of deep interest. I really want to try to figure out how to participate in test grid. I, under, I, like, I totally agree with what um, 
Tim is saying, but I think, like, I feel like we actually do have to like prove that we can keep it green uh, before we can really make it blocking. Um, but at any rate, I don't know if this is the right form or not, but I would uh, love to work with you to figure out what's a good way for us to think about, because um, I, I think we do think of this in terms of how do we support Kubernetes on CI on Amazon, but also have also um, hook in EKS in so that we're getting, you know, twice the twice the signal. Um, and it's important for us to be able to do both. So and, and excellent. And uh, I think it's Nick Turner from your group is showing up to those cloud provider meetings. So I, I, he's, I have he's plugged in. Yeah, I have asked him. Uh, this is, you know, part of our way to try to get plugged in. I have asked, uh, I have uh, asked him to start doing that because I know this is important. But um, uh, I think the specific way, uh, like best practice for a cloud provider to interact with TestGrid is uh, perhaps a bit outside the, the remit of that group. I don't know. Maybe it isn't. I, I also think if we had, I, I do support the idea of having more providers in test grid because you know COPS is currently the only one testing a bunch of other stuff and I would love for COPS to be just like one vote amongst five and so if COPS is failing it isn't blocking everyone as long as I'm the only one letting the side down right now it's like you know all on me but like if I was if I had a, a free pass as long as I was the only one of those five that would be helpful <laughs> Uh, so I will take the action item to get the folks uh, who are working on that in the cloud provider uh, working group to socialize that more and, and loop this group in as well. I think there is significant overlap uh, and it's not a coincidence that that group is working on uh, submitting results pulled out of Sonobui, uh, running the conformance test back to test grid. Uh, that came out of me also being involved here. So I think it'll be uh, at, at least uh, worthy of exploration and maybe we find better ways of doing things also. Okay, any more <clears throat> questions on that topic before we move on to the next item? Okay, uh, I think uh, Srini has a topic. Training on mute. Yeah, hi. Um, I, I sent out a document um, just a few minutes ago and I pasted it out in the chat. Um, probably I'll share it on the screen here. So, uh, much easier for me to go through. Uh, can you guys see my screen? Uh, give me one second. I'll yes, we can see it. Um, some of the work items I thought that uh, 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 we can work on. I uh, cr created this document about a uh, few weeks ago, and uh, uh, and um, the timelines here probably will not make much sense. But uh, the overall goals for this uh, is to increase the certification coverage um, and uh, raise bar on the. Uh, conformance documentation, uh, the documentation that we have right now. I'll walk you through some of that uh, quickly. How much time do I got? Uh, about 10, 15 um, minutes? Pretty much as much as you need, I think. Okay, awesome. Uh, and then some tooling that uh, is required to approve conformance tests uh, when, they are, when, when PRs get merged. And then we can also gather some future list items here. Uh, some of them are like the, the one I stated here, uh, the exploratory items, which I'm not really very familiar with, but we'll cover that at the end of the other things. So in order to achieve the first three goals, which is uh, conformance coverage and documentation and uh, tooling, uh, I split that into two pieces. One is the test suite enhancements. The other one is the tooling enhancements. About the test suite enhancement, um, it's an iterative process. Uh, we, we keep changing uh, or adding conformance tests, I believe, uh, and they all uh, bubble up to Kubernetes major release. release. So, um, 
so uh, which will address the areas of coverage gaps and strengthen the existing test suite, whatnot. Um, the proposal here is to approach individual six to identify uh, such gaps in the test cases or um, strengthen the existing test cases. I'm mostly um, referring to ETE test cases here. Um, uh, that's what it's been so far. Um, and uh, either the SIG, owning SIGs or individual parties would put an effort to add uh, new test cases or, or fix the existing test cases to, to have better checks. So uh, some of the examples like, you know, uh, existing test cases are part of the conformance, but they don't do uh, all the checks that are required. Maybe we need to um, strengthen them. And uh, at the end of it, um, this process, um, SIG architecture, I, I, I don't know, I believe it is the SIG architecture is to approve um, the, the newly identified conformance test cases. Um, and uh, like we talked about, uh, one other thing here is uh, about the coverage, basically. What percentage of the ETA test cases are now conformance test cases? And out of which, how much percentage of the core code they are testing? So that's a, that's a much more complex topic. Um, but we need to address that at some point in time. Uh, that's pretty much about the con uh, adding coverage, which is an iterative process. Um, the second part, which I kind of started working on this is fortify, um, of course, um, based on the approval that if we want to uh, pursue this, and I think it's uh, uh, important, um, fortify the test documentation that we have right now. So uh, we are generating a test document for all the conformance tests and it is uh, checked in under CNCF um, docs section. Um, the tech debt here is um, that the conformance documentation needs to be in, um, uh, solidified basically. It, meets, it, it needs um, to conform to RFC 2119 keywords, meaning that um, doing this and this um, would enforce this behavior in Kubernetes. And uh, we, we need, uh, a user do not have to go and look at Go code to understand what the test is doing, what the behavior of Kubernetes should be. Um, they should be able to read and say, this must happen. as. Uh, as part of the, uh, running this test. So, so uh, quick question there. Are we going to, I know there was work by other folks to get some of the documentation in place, but are we going to have like a more rigorous uh, breakdown of some of these tests in place that will follow this documentation and publish it as part of the main doc site underneath like a conformance label? Because I get asked questions all the time about test A versus B and what does this actually mean? Yeah, Srini, maybe you should show them the doc so you can see the, the, the revamp documentation that you're talking about. I'll give a better example. Yeah. Um, uh, hang on one second. Um, so currently, this is the document we are generating. So we have some metadata that we, we extract from the ETA test cases in the Go file. Um, and then uh, we have a nice name to a to the test and then the documentation is part of the comment section about this test. The test has um, this metadata on top of it, uh, which gives you the test name and the description. And the description should be like I'm showing here, it should be very detailed enough so a person reading through this documentation understands what this test is doing. And uh, there are ways to describe, this is describing what the test is doing. And rather than if we describe what the behavior on, in Kubernetes should be, uh, it would be a lot easier uh, for people to understand uh, and then explain what the test is doing. Like for example, um, some of the work I'm trying to do here is um, in this particular case that I highlight, 
the original documentation is very skimpy, like one liner saying, make sure that the pod with readiness probe uh, should not be ready before initial delay. But a person to understand the test, what we are trying to do here is create a pod, configure it with initial delay, uh, set on the readiness probe and check the pod start time. Things like yeah. that so that people will know what the test is doing. Um, so I, I love this. I, I, I agree with all of it. I, I, my question is a question of logistics. Like, are we going to, as part of a release process for 1.10, have this detailed information for that specific release published as part of the Kubernetes docs? Because I think, I think it almost has to be, right? Mm. Um, yeah, the intent is to go through all the existing test cases that we have, because right now there are, a lot of them are, are very sparse with, with respect to documentation. <clears throat> so take all the work that Srini's done here, put them into the existing test cases, and then do exactly what you said, Tim. Make sure that as part of the process, that we document the expectations for all the additional test cases that are going to come in the future to meet this bar. Yes. Right. Yeah. yeah. The doc I, I love it. So. The love doc it. Um, currently is great. Uh, okay, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I was just offering encouragement and saying this is great. Uh, I didn't mean to cut you off. No problem. Thanks. Um, so yeah, the document page currently is CNCF. But yeah, definitely if uh, docs uh, needs to be, that process needs to be employed sometime. So um, that's uh, about the, uh, the conformance test suite, uh, suite enhancements. Basically, uh, we are proposing this standard and the idea is to generate the, uh, the documentation based off of this standard uh, and for the 110, for the existing test, and all new tests should adhere to this uh, new new specifier, read like this specification bar standard, right? So that's what I'm trying to say um, in that particular uh, case. Um, the other thing I'm proposing is tooling enhancements uh, around conformance tests. Uh, the idea here is anybody today can submit a PR and by accident or by intention, they can change an it clause to a conformance it. So by conformancing, Conformance it. Um, they 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 are well. Uh, their test will be part of the conformance uh, suite, and there are no uh, checks and bounds right now to to identify. Yes, the yeah. Hi, this is Srini. Sorry, we're just going to interrupt for a minute because there was some work done on this, and I, I think maybe it didn't get uh, communicated broadly. So just want to make sure that Matt has a chance to talk about. Uh, I think what he. Uh, he did to address this exact problem. Yeah, so this is Matt Liggett. Um, the, the, if you have a look at the owner's file under Kubernetes test conformance, it, it already, uh, that test verifies that the list of conformance tests doesn't change, and changes to that file require approval from SIG architecture, um, and only SIG architecture. Uh, if you look at the list of conformance tests, it hasn't changed in the about three months. I'm pretty sure that's because nobody has either gotten or received approval, like asked for or received approval from SIG architecture. Does that mean? So in, in other words, I believe this item is done. Well, so we should we should document that, I guess, <clears throat> in the conformance work group docs. That, yeah, that, that's that's awesome. Uh, so how do we uh, essentially enforce that? I mean, if I have an ETA test that I'm writing. Uh, yeah, if you add any, if you were to add conformance it to a new test, it would make a different test under Kubernetes test conformance fail because that thing checks that the list of all conformance it invocations matches a golden list of, of conformance tests. To get the test to pass, you have to edit that golden list, but to check in changes to the golden list, you have to get an approval from someone in SIG architecture. Okay. Yeah, definitely. I would like to know more details about that. Um, yeah. Is that, is that it is documented somewhere? Yeah, I'll drop it into the uh, group chat. Cool. Um, another, question, another question I have, if somebody is 
modifying the existing conformance test, do we catch that? Or the, the reason I'm asking is because the conformance test passes for 110 and somebody changes something in the conformance test. Right. Yeah. But, but that's on your test grid, right? Like. No, no, what, uh, that, that is a gap. Uh, and that would be a great place to spend effort is to okay. check, I don't know, file length or actually compare diff. Or... This gets pretty hairy, I'll say, yeah. because um, <laughs> the test can just be one line or it calls another function or, or, I mean, that's not likely, but the point is that the test code is going to call a bunch of other code that can't all be under this level of review. So checking that the definition of the test doesn't change is, is very difficult. But at least checking that the list of tests yeah. doesn't change is something we can control. I mean, I mean, I think I think participants of this program should be running the you know the the early versions right of the release to, to catch these things. Yeah, like, like if, if a conformance test changes in a negative way that they think is a bug, like that should be called through like release candidate checking or like. Uh, but but it is worth additional thought. Uh, we talked about it and backed away from it because it is much more difficult. Uh, so full disclosure, we we, we didn't uh, really think too deeply about that one. Uh, it, and that would be a great place to put effort, Srini, if you are interested in improving the tooling. Yeah, but again, that, that means, um, I, I understand it is a difficult task because, you know, you going through each and every PR and semantically identifying such um, behavior is 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 going to be uh, hit on the CI process and whatnot, right? So it's uh, going to slow down uh, lots of things. But yeah, I was I was thinking like maybe like Go Form to be run, Go Lint to be run. We if we can have a tool that we can run as a developer, I believe in nothing has changed that trickles down to the actual conformance test. That would be great, but I don't know. Uh, I'll, I'll put some thought process probably and come back. Um, yeah, the, um, so if that is done, um, the other uh, little proposal I have here is about the versioning of the conformance test today. Um, the metadata around the conformance test is just the test name and the description, but we do not know when the test has been added as part of the components. Uh, if the documentation that we are generating also tells when the test is added to the components and if there are any other modifications to the test, that information is also part of the documentation. So I'm proposing another metadata around uh, the test um, uh, comments that we add on top of the test to have a release number um, saying that this test is added during release 1.10 or whatnot. So, uh, apart from that, um, there is a little discussion we had with William on uh, uh, this exploratory item where if there are any use cases where people want to certify against a subset of the test cases, which is which is a open item at this point, if there are any thoughts on this, we can discuss or any other. Uh, yeah, someone added this to the agenda as well. I'm not sure who, but uh, it, it, there was a, um, I think uh, maybe Dan knows the full story, but someone actually tried to certify what was more of a tool rather than a distribution or platform. Um, so we have to actually uh, remove that certification um, just for process reasons. Uh, and I kind of raised the point like, okay, like, do, do we need something? I mean, this is kind of more long term, I guess, but do we need some program uh, for such tools? Uh, yeah, yeah, let me dive in here. This um, really should be on the agenda for next time. It, it might even take up the yeah. whole um, call. But the, the, the quick background to it is that um, Aqua participated in the original certification program and aqua is a security add-on that um, runs in sidecars and um, the controller and basically they installed aqua and then showed that the a kubernetes distro still passed all the conformance tests hey hey dan it yeah. actually wasn't aqua it was twistlock because this is john oh i'm sorry about that yeah, so that was, right. I'm very interested in this topic. I just want to make sure. No, no, and, and, well, yeah, and, and, yeah. So I, I, but I apologize for the error. 
and sure. and so then uh, but then they the, they were essentially using the conformance test to test something that it doesn't test and that it was never designed to test. And I, I reached out to them and they very kindly um, withdrew their certification um, because otherwise we were just gonna get dozens of uh, companies that were gonna come in in the same way. But uh, essentially uh, my current belief is that there's no need for a container certification program because um, Linux as well, the Linux ABI is well enough to find Docker containers and OCI and such are well enough to find. But that I, I do think that there's potentially some value to something like Kubernetes third party add ons. And that's a very vague term, but the examples would be a security add on like an Aqua or um, a, uh, a twist lock um, or also possibly a storage vendor. And the basic thing to, to test would be can we confirm that the, um, are only using public APIs? And so you would uh, have a conformant Kubernetes, you would turn on an HTTP proxy, and then you would make all of your calls as part of the installation through that proxy. And we would verify that yes, every call you're making is an allowed public API Kubernetes call. And then at the end, you would say, yes, I fully installed my third party application. Um, and so I'm only using valid API calls. Thank and you. so it, it, but it would actually be a, a totally separate program. Um, the, the, I don't know that that proxy exists yet. Um, I, I mean, I think the list of APIs do, um, but the, the, the process and such. And so I, I, I apologize, I'm a month late now on sending an email to the list laying out this idea. Um, and, and I don't think we can resolve it all in the next nine minutes, but I did want to just bring it up as something that um, I, I think it, it, there is a meaningful demand for. Yeah, but I like, I like how you separated it out as a separate program to avoid confusion. I, I see the need for it, and I, I do like how you're, you're positioning it because I think it will reduce confusion the way you're positioning it. Yeah, the reason right. we did it initially was frankly – because it was a little confusing when the program first came out, we really wanted to make sure that if there were such a thing that we were taking advantage of it, obviously after it came out, it got more specific about what the target was, which is why we were confused. But uh, Dan, the, the term that we had talked about over uh, email with that was uh, Kubernetes certified tooling. And I thought tooling was a particularly good term because it you know, kind of implies that it's not applications that you're gonna run, but, but like kind of system level utilities. And there certainly is, I mean, I think there, there would be a lot of interest in that from us, certainly, but I think just the larger community would like to have that as well. I, yeah, I, 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 I like that. Um, yeah, but I'm not sure that it's big enough because I, I think there's like a real interest from storage. And I don't know that that quite counts as tooling. Okay. But I do um, want to come up with the term like that, yeah. to exclude applications. Yeah. Because, I, I mean, I, I just, there shouldn't be a need to just certify your MongoDB or your WordPress or whatever it is you, you want to run. That's right. And just curiously, how are you going to keep those tools from doing some third party or hidden API that doesn't get through your proxy? I'm just curious how you enforce it. I mean, surely you can capture every time they are going through the proxy to, to a Kubernetes API, but I would assume there's multiple ways they could be like doing weird things under the covers, but uh, that maybe that's for another meeting. I was just kind of a curious. No, no, it's a fair point, but I, I mean, the basic idea would be the same as, as with this, where people can obviously lie about their conformance tests. Okay. But somebody would try and install it on a um, certified Kubernetes installation in the future, it wouldn't work. Oh, okay. um, and then they would report that and we'd, we'd go and investigate it. So it, 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 it presumes a non-maliciousness, but there is a kind of crowdsourcing check for it. Gotcha. William, do you have any comments on that tooling idea? Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I, I, think, I think we should definitely talk about it. Um, I, I like the idea that, I mean, some of these add-ons and tools do kind of modify uh, the cost of, so I think it's, yeah, I think, I think users will want to have some assurance of the components there. Uh, sorry, Jay, uh, So strange if you don't uh, like so I, I put together a, a doc a, a couple months ago as we were going through the conformance program about uh, made for Kubernetes program, which uh, the inspiration for that was the, the same idea uh, that it would work on any conformance Kubernetes cluster. 
Uh, and I do agree that it's a separate program, uh, but essentially uh, ensuring that there's no requirement for vendor specific uh, uh, identity or some tie-in there, uh, and that they would be portable across various uh, providers and uh, distribution. Uh, so I will clean up that doc and share it with the rest of this group. Uh, I think it's relevant to this conversation. We'd love to get thoughts on it. Sounds great. Cool. So, so this conversation seemed to focus a lot around tooling, and I just want to point out that, that if you look at Srini's doc, uh, um, actually, Srini, can you share that, that doc yeah. again, just for a sec? All right. There was one other thing in there, um, which is how do we allow for some sort of conformance checking of plugins? And I think some people on the chat here might have casually mentioned it, but I don't think it was explicitly stated. Um, but I think at some point we need to talk about you know, how do, for example, a, how does a CRI plugin or a, a CSI plugin uh, uh, get some sort of certification statement that says, yes, we conform properly to the CSI interface and you can use us as sort of an, a, an approved Kubernetes CSI plugin type thing. Um, there's no formal proposal around that. If you scroll down just a little, Srini. Um, but I want to make sure that people start thinking about how we're going to, you know, allow people to certify those plugins. I, I have a related question. Um, and uh, I apologize in advance if you guys have covered this already and you can tell me to go read the docs or something. Um, but I think the, the related question is about, um, and it could be related to say uh, third party, uh, you know, someone's adding something onto a cluster, but what they need in order for their proprietary thing to work is a custom scheduler. Um, uh, I, I, is, how do we view that in a conformance case? Right. So as long as the default Kubernetes scheduler passes all of the default Kubernetes conformance, we're good. So Bob, I think that's directly related to what I was just saying, because I think yeah. a, a custom scheduler is no different than say a CSI plugin from that perspective. Correct, and, I agree. Yeah, and I, I think we need to brainstorm around how we're gonna do certification around those, because it is, it is a different beast than what we've talked about in the past. Yeah. Well, you better be careful, though. I mean, you, you're, you're going to make the mistakes that past communities have made where we think we're providing value to the customer by doing things like that. And then and you end up hurting the overall community brand by doing it because then things stop being, uh, you, you know, you're differentiating based on your scheduler, and uh, but now you're actually hurting the overall interoperability, the ability of the customer to have no vendor lock-in. So please, you know, really think through what you're saying and think of how it benefits the overall customer because it's very, very dangerous waters. Yeah, well, I think what's important is that the base Kubernetes conformance test suite should probably always pass. I mean, not, there may be examples that, that break that, but I think by default position should be the Kubernetes conformance test suite still passes even with a custom scheduler as an example, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the custom, the custom scheduler itself is necessarily 100% uh, kosher, put it that way. And so it might be kind of nice if, for example, the SIG scheduling working group came up if they had their own set of test cases to verify that plugins at this point of the Kubernetes architecture are compliant. The, Just as an example. The, the example I'm thinking of is um, slightly different than that. Um, there was even uh, well, the community meeting a few minutes ago, um, there was something that was sort of along this line. Um, but it you know, the, if you read like a lot of the docs around Kubernetes, one of the cool things is that people well, say, look, you can write your own scheduler to do like special things. Um, so there's a lot of encouragement around people to do that. Um, a lot of the tests here, it look like are headed towards testing a standard, um, uh, the standard default community scheduler. Um, what you're kind of saying is that the implication here is that to pass conformance, you're going to have to include like a conformant cluster would probably need to like practically speaking, need to include the default scheduler. But if you have some additional things that are based on naming a scheduler um, after that, and that's added on, then you should be fine. Right? It's replacing the default scheduler is a much higher bar. I agree. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I think that I think we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, uh, to be honest. I, I understand the purpose of trying to talk about this early, but I do think um, 
some of the aspects of being able to support this in the community uh, are not there, right? Because right now a lot of SIGs uh, individually have enough time keeping up <laughs> just with the community itself. Uh, and we're kind of asking it to up the bar uh, to be able to have these levels of guarantees around the behavior. Um, so I, I appreciate the conversation and I do think it is, a, is it important in the long term? I do, I also believe that it's way ahead of where some of these SIGs are at uh, in, in the nature of the project and its maturity level at this point. Yeah, I would agree. That's why it's under the exploratory items. Um, although, having said that, I wouldn't mind um, at the next face-to-face -face meeting we have, whether it's KubeCon EU or someplace else, to start brainstorming some ideas around there, not necessarily to come up with concrete proposals, but at least have people start thinking about it and think what kind of things we could consider doing. And then as we get, you know, as we have future meetings, we can maybe start to solidify around a proposal that at some point in the future we could bring forward to the group. I, I think that the likelihood that something like Firmament would show up at SIG scalability and say, hey, we want to start working with the scalability SIG um, uh, is probably uh, more of a short-term thing than a long-term thing, I'm guessing. I, I can see that happening. Um, and it would be good for us, maybe we can add this to the brainstorming, like what, as a SIG, what should our reaction to that be? Like, yes, here, here's how we'll deal with an add-on scheduler, or no, go past conformance and then come back and talk to us when you can cover all the basic cases. So folks, I, I think we should probably end there um, on time, but it, it's pretty clear from the conversation that we should uh, keep going with these um, uh, twice a month meetings. And so um, on the made for Kubernetes and the tooling certification or whatever we decide to call it, I'll bring that to the list. I'd encourage you to, to bring other topics to the list as well, obviously each with their own subject header. And uh, then I'll talk to you in, uh, in two weeks. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, thanks everyone. Right, thanks, everyone. Thanks, take care. Hey.